Amen. Well, that story that Corbin shared, I actually own a few first edition sermons printed in 1540 from Hugh Latimer. And uh, it's wonderful to look at those sermons and go, wow, that, that was a real person with a real scenario that really suffered for Christ. So what a blessing to hear that story. Romans 8.29, this is part one on what we're calling the golden chain of salvation. By God's grace, uh, we have moved on from 828. Uh, I was there for three straight weeks, breaking down that beautiful passage of scripture. Romans 828 was such a foundational doctrine for what we will be discussing today. Uh, we talked about the fallacy of free will. We talked about the possession of free agency, the doctrines of sovereignty and providence. Uh, we touched on the significance of calling in salvation. If you haven't listened to those, go back on our Kingsway Sermons podcast and you can listen to those. But we spent so much time on verse 28 because understanding the doctrine of sovereignty and providence is crucial to understanding verses 29 and 30. It's hard for you to grasp I should say, if it's hard for you to grasp uh, the biblical truth that God chose you and that you didn't choose God, uh, your redemption is going to have this sense of, of flatness. It's going to have a sense of uh, synergism where God did his part and you did your part. But if you struggle to yield to the reality of providence in the work of salvation, this text will stumble you. In fact, if you don't submit your emotions to the doctrine of providence, you're going to be forced to engage in what I call exegetical gymnastics, where you start molding your own ideas of salvation and projecting them upon the text. We see this quite often. But if you surrender your desires and you, you, uh, you put aside philosophy and you allow the text of Scripture to shape how you think and feel, around the doctrine of salvation, you're gonna love this passage of scripture. Now to remind you of the context of chapter eight, uh, Paul is telling Christians about the various forms of divine assistance that the Christians receive in this present time of sufferings. Uh, but all of these supports that we talked about in previous weeks, the greatest help, the greatest divine assistance is that we have benevolent providence controlling and causing all things to work together for our good. In the verses ahead, we're going to uncover how this benevolent providence that we saw in verses 28 reaches into the heart of your actual personal salvation. And it's, it's more than just justification through faith. We're, we're going beyond that reality. It encompasses uh, divine love, uh, electing grace, uh, predestination, effectual calling, eternal security. These are some of the, the core elements that we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks. We're going to see that this entire process of redemption was divinely orchestrated before the foundation of the world. Now, none of this should shock you because you read your Bible. And if you look at verse 28, the very end, it says, in, uh, it says, that we were called according to whose purpose? That we were called according to his purpose. So when we think about divine orchestration, we shouldn't be shocked because we already saw last week that we are called according to his purposes. Our salvation is his purpose, not our purpose. When you embrace this concept of God being divinely purposing your own salvation, you're going to begin to feel the personal touch of God's undeserved love. And that I think is missing in many circles in Christendom. You're going to retire the notion that salvation is somehow your own initiative. And you're going to rejoice in divine intervention. You're going to feel grateful, astonished, indebted, uh, overwhelmed by God's love. 
Romans 29 and 30 are often called the golden chain of salvation. Many theologians have named it this. I'm not sure who the first person was to give it that title. But it's the outline of the process of redemption according to Scripture. Now, you cannot escape, as you will see, the implication that from beginning to end, salvation is a work of God. It's not dependent upon human decision. It's not dependent upon human effort or human maintenance. R.C. Sproul says of this, he says, quote, This is called the golden chain because there is a chain of redemptive actions listed in the text. It is shorthand for what theologians call the ordo salutis, which is Latin for the order of salvation. Ultimately, these verses help us understand what logically comes first in the process of redemption, end quote. All right, so if you're going to look down in your Bibles for a second, look down to verses 28, 29, and 30. You're going to see five redemptive actions. Number one, foreknowing. Number two, predestining. Number three, calling. Number four, justifying. And number five, glorifying. We're going to make it through the entire chain over the next several weeks. Today in verse 29, I'm going to be covering the first two links of that chain. Today's text says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now again, to preface my exposition, Paul just said that at the end of verse 28, that our calling and our election was according to his purpose. Remember, we're, we're, looking at, we're not looking at this piece of text in isolation from the rest of the text around it. We don't do that. That's proof texting. I say this often all the time. I, I go, imagine walking into just a 30-second clip of Lord of the Rings. And you see a ring and you go, oh man, he must be on his way to a wedding. You have no clue of the context of the reality of the story. And so we need to make sure that we look at, okay, what did the verse before say? Well, it's according to his purpose. And here in verse 29, he's explaining the substance and the extent of that purpose. He's communicating how God carries us from the preborn state all the way to that glory that will be revealed in us, mentioned in Romans 8, uh, 18. Now, I want you to notice, okay, we're going to be grammarians today. You're going to pay attention to grammar. Notice that he continues to use the demonstrative pronoun those, those, okay, which maintains the language of what? A specific group or a limited group of people. Okay, he said it twice in verse 28, those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Here, he continues by saying, for those whom he foreknew. So he's still talking about a unique, select group of people. Not everybody, but a particular group of people. And this is important because if we interpret the term foreknew to be just a simple pre-existent knowledge of reality, it clashes with the idea of God's all-knowing nature. Now stay with me here, okay? Stay with me. We are smart people. This is very important for you to grasp because it'll be a way that you can defend this against people who have different interpretations. Okay, since God knows everything, God knows everything. He's omniscient. Every single Christian on earth is going to affirm that reality. He would know everyone, not just those whom he foreknew. If he was talking about a simple foreknowing of information, then the word foreknew would have to be just about everyone, because he foreknew everyone. But if the word foreknew is not talking about information, but is talking about relationship with particular people, then we have a problem. The apostle's use of those forces us to see that this foreknowing is not speaking to the omniscient foreknowing of knowledge. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about God knew information. He's talking about a foreknowing of relationship. And that is the same type of knowing that we see in 1 Corinthians 8.3 that says, but if anyone loves God, 
He is known by him. He is known by him. Romans 11, 2, just two chapters later, or three chapters later, Paul writes, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay, pay attention. He has not rejected his people who he foreknew. Again, if it's speaking to God's general omniscience, we have a problem. But because we know that he's talking about a relational reality, we can see that he's saying God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He's not talking about everyone. He's talking about a select group of people that he had a relationship with. So no matter what, we have to acknowledge that the term foreknew grammatically, logically, is not speaking to the foreknowledge of information but the relational foreknowing of a particular people. Amen? Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus speaks to the relational reality of knowing. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and do many and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is the type of knowing that we're talking about. Did Jesus not know those people that they existed? Certainly he did. Jesus is omniscient. Jesus knows every single person. Jesus in his deity of God knows the number of every person's hairs on their head. In the Old Testament, we see a similar word to the Greek word for new. The the Hebrew word is yada. Um, It means to know by experience. To know by experience. Um, It's also the same word that's used when it says that Adam knew his wife. Um, this is, it's not, a, it's an intimate knowing. It's not an erotic or sexual knowing. It's really just an intimate knowing. It's a knowing of that portion. It's also the word in Jeremiah 1.5 that says, God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Exodus 33, 17 includes this word again, shows this relational element. It says, quote, the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. I have known you by name. There's so many more. Uh, What is uh, John 10? My sheep know me and they follow me. You know, John 6, I call them by name. There is a relational knowing that we must recognize. Now, the relational interpretation of foreknowing is vital because we live in an age where people want to reduce this word to just a foreknowledge of information. About 15 years ago, I remember driving on the 10 freeway in Southern California, listening to Pastor's Perspective, which is the Calvary Chapel uh, radio program with Pastor Chuck Smith and Brian Broderson. And I remember someone calling in asking the specific question about Romans 8.29. What does it mean to foreknow? What, you know, how does God foreknow us? And Chuck answered with something along the lines of, quote, uh, God looked into the future to observe how each person would respond to the gospel during their lifetime. Based on this divine foresight, he predestined for salvation those individuals whom he foreknew would respond faithfully to the gospel's call. Okay. That, that was his answer. And I totally bought it. Okay, that was the view that I held for many, many years. Uh, first, let me give you several problems with this view. Um, this view puts man as the decisive catalyst for salvation. It puts man as the decisive catalyst for salvation. It reduces God to a bystander. He becomes a bystander who can only do so much and must wait and see 
if we make the right decision. Because God's a gentleman, right? That's what they say. He's not going to violate your free will, right? That's what they say. In other words, God makes salvation possible, but man is ultimately sovereign over the consummation of that salvation. This is false thinking. This is how they view the redemption of humanity. They believe that God makes a way, but that's it. You have to make the decision. Now, we know the problem with that is that you become the decisive catalyst for your own salvation. You become essentially sovereign over your redemption. If you're going to be saved, it's up to you. And what that does is that if you compare two individuals who heard the gospel, if you have two individuals that heard the gospel, one person follows Jesus and the other person doesn't. One person says, well, I follow Jesus because I believed and he didn't. Well, I would say, well, why did you believe and he didn't? No matter what you say, you get yourself into a boast. Well, because I guess I was smarter. Because I guess I was wiser. Because I guess I was more sensitive to my sinful reality. No matter what you do, if salvation is dependent upon you, then you have room to boast in comparison to the next person who also heard the gospel, but did not make the right decision. Number two, this view stands in complete opposition to the overwhelming number of scriptures we discussed in the previous three sermons, as well as the substance of the previous verse. Verse 28 claims that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. They're called according to his purpose. That degree of sovereignty cannot coexist with a viewpoint that restricts God from causing salvation. How can God control all things yet not control the saving of his own people? How can he work everything together if he's waiting and dependent upon the decisions of men. If God's purpose is dependent upon man's free choice, you have a massive illogical contradiction that are incompatible ideas on so many dimensions. It's, it's easy to look at the front and go, oh, it's not that bad. But when you take that down and you deduce it to its logical theological conclusions, you realize that there is a massive root problem with that reality. Third, this view injures the doctrine of omniscience because it creates a learning God. It creates a God that learns. Uh, if foreknew really means to foresee, which is what Chuck Smith messes with the grammar, he really, it's not about foreknowing relationally, it's about foreseeing information. It creates a God who looks to discover the actions of men and then adjusts his plan accordingly. He literally is having to adjust his plan according to the actions that he cannot see because he cannot violate their free will. He is waiting to find out what they will do according to that view. One pastor said of this view, it seems to me that the prescient view, which is what this is called, must deny the doctrine of omniscience because it demands that God at some point does not know something about a person, namely the choice they may or may not make regarding the gospel. He doesn't know according to the prescient view. Ultimately, what we're seeing is that the prescient view is that men are so unwilling to let go of this concept of free will that they force an emotional philosophy upon the Bible. And my preaching professor, Dr. Steve Lawson, once said to me, uh, he said it many, many, many times, but the free will is the pagan goddess that the church has worshiped for far too long, end quote. And we should not be shocked by this, right? We live in a self-actualized culture. We are the cause 
of our own destiny, according to humanism. Okay, we worship autonomy. We worship individualization. We worship independence. It should not shock us that we are obsessed with free will. It, I mean, if you go back through church history, this conversation about free will was, in many senses, non-existent. It wasn't really until the Enlightenment era of 16, 1700s that this started to become a greater and greater discussion. So when Paul says, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined. He's demonstrating how divine affection, divine foreknowing, divine desire for relationship must precede divine action. That relationship comes before predestination. That relationship precedes these actions that will work together for your good. The reason God predestines a person is because he has set his love upon that person. In the same way that he set his love upon Israel. He did not set his love upon the Philistines. He set his love upon Israel. Jeremiah 31.3 shows this divine and logical progression when God says to Israel, quote, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Relationship and affection precede action. Fundamental reality, right, that we start to see here. Loving relationship produces these benevolent actions that uphold that love. And that is what we're seeing in this text, which leads us to the next section of our passage. If you look to verse 29b, it says, He also predestined us to become conformed to the image of His Son. He also predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. Okay, the word predestined, um, it means to predetermine the destiny or end of individuals or events before the creation of the world. The word in of itself requires you to believe that God is sovereign over salvation. To predetermine the destiny, that's what it means. Predetermine the end before the creation of that particular event or person. That's what God does. He's a predestining God. You get to deal with that fact. God doesn't go and learn something about you and then comes back and then predestines you. That's stupid. That's false thinking. It's folly. The word predestined is six times used in the New Testament, two of which are here in Romans 8, 29, and 30. But it's also used in Luke speaking to the predestination of Christ's crucifixion. Acts 4, 27 through 29, it talks about God preordaining and predetermining the events of his crucifixion and his very death. We see the same word in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, speaking to the predestiny of the kingdom of Christ coming through the gospel. We see the term used twice again in Ephesians 1 and 1, uh, 1 chapter, sorry, chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 1, verse 11. And it speaks to the predestiny of God's people to adoption. He predetermined their adoption into his family. He predetermined, uh, in verse 11, God's people to a divine purpose. We cannot escape the reality of predestination. We cannot contort it to mean something, to do this exegetical gymnastics, instead of just letting the text be the text. But the predestin predestination before us, sorry, this thing is moving here. The predestination before us is defined. Look at verse 29. It says, those whom God has relationally foreknown, he has predestined to a particular end. He predestined them to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. If you're saved, you have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Just think about that statement for a second. If you are a born-again believer, you were predetermined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
How can that work with the prescient view that God is waiting for you, waiting to find out if you would choose him? It cannot work. It is illogical. Now, this is a very important section of the sermon, and it's very short, but I want you guys to grasp this. We are to be conformed to the image of his son. Why is that important? In creation, humanity was made in the image of God. Humanity was made in the image of God. But when sin entered, humanity lost the pureness of that image. I'm going to give you an explanation for that. In Genesis 5.3, when Adam lived 130 years, it says, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. That's interesting. It's very interesting. That God creates Adam in his own image, but then Adam falls and he has a son that he produces in his likeness of fallenness and his own image of fallen humanity. And he named him Seth. In other words, the reason we need to be conformed to the image of Christ, the second Adam, is because we are born in the likeness and the image of the first Adam. I'm going to say that one more time because I want you to really grasp this. The reason we need to be conformed to the image of Christ, the second Adam, is because we are born in the likeness and in the image of the second or of the first Adam. This is What this really means is it's not just a predestination of grace. This is a predestination of restoration of image. We are no longer in the image of Adam. We are in the image of Christ. Romans 5 spends an entire chapter talking about that. This was part of the reason for the incarnation. It's the reintroduction of sinless humanity to redeem a portion of fallen humanity. There's so much to talk there. So much to discuss there. I I almost wanted to turn this into another sermon, but we got to keep moving. There is also another form of predestination that we will hear in reform circles, especially it's the predestination of justice and desolation. Now, I will say before we talk about this, because I felt like I couldn't get around not dealing with this particular topic as we get through the sermon. Scripture does not speak of the predestination of the wicked in the same way that it speaks of the predestination of the elect. So we have to be clear there. But I do believe it's a logical deduction that if God predestines some to salvation, if he decides to save some, as he has always done throughout the Old Testament, and we are grafted into Israel, we should not expect that to be different. If he decides to save some and pass over others and leave them to justice, he is in some way exercising sovereignty over the ultimate destinies of the wicked. We have to admit that fact. So some people call this double predestination. Others call it election and reprobation. You might just call it you know, uh, grace and justice. There's no injustice. There's just grace and mercy, and there's justice and wrath. 1 Peter 2.8, in speaking of those who rejected Christ, says, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Romans 9.21-22 speaks of the Potter, talking about God, who out of the clay makes some people for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. In verse 22, it says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, has endured with with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. 
Jesus in John 3, 18, alludes to this predetermined judgment of the wicked when he says, quote, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. You got to think about this. Jesus says, I'm not coming here to judge. That'll come in the future. So he's talking about future events that have already been done. You've been judged already. Jesus is projecting an eternal mindset on a world that lives within time. So understanding predestination is essential to understanding the sovereignty and the grace of God. There is a great book, if you're still struggling and wrestling through this doctrine, which honestly, I wouldn't expect anything less. This is a very difficult doctrine. A great book is The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination by Dr. Lorraine Bettner. Lorraine is a man, I know, it's unfortunate. But um, <laughs> he was B.B. Warfield's protege, uh, went to the Princeton Theological Seminary back in the early uh, 1900s. He died, I think, in 1997. Uh, it's actually available in our app, the Relearn app. You can listen to it in audio, you can buy it, you can read it in there in the, as an ebook. But I highly suggest that you spend some time reading that book. It is a massively comprehensive argument that it's just impossible to get around the facts. Once you understand this doctrine of predestination and it settles into your mind, it's going to erupt a series of critical questions. You're going to ask, if God predestines, why evangelize? If God predestines, are my children elect? If God predestines, how can God rightly judge the reprobate? These are very common and important questions that needs to be addressed. And I didn't want to address all of them deeply because it would take so much time, but I am going to deal with them shortly just to give you a little bit of an answer so that you can calm your mind of the matter if you're struggling through this. If God predestines, why evangelize? I wrote an article about this available on Relearn if you want to read it. Um, first, because God commands us to in the Great Commission. Second, uh, God doesn't just predestine the ends, predetermining the ends. God causes all things to work together. He predetermines the means. If God predetermined that a car was to crash through this room, he would also predetermine the driver and the car manufacturer and uh, the, the, the man who is living his schedule for the day, he predetermines not just the ends, but also prede predetermines the means. Romans 10, 14 through 15 says, and how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear with someone or without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And so we know that, why do we preach the gospel? Even though we believe that God has an elect, we don't know who the elect is. All we know is that we're called to share the gospel and proclaim the gospel to the whole world. And that God is saving people from every tribe and nation and tongue. And that God doesn't just predetermine the ends, but he predetermines the means of my faithful preaching of that message. Number two, if God predestines are my children elect, I remember when I came to this conclusion years ago, I had just started a relationship with Doug Wilson. And within an hour of this conclusion, that was the first question I had. And I called him and spent an hour and a half having this discussion with him over the phone. Predestination removes the notion that we can secure our children's salvation through intellectual persuasion. That when you believe that you're persuaded to God, it, it, it allows you to think that you can have more sovereignty or control over your children's salvation. But when you start to realize that God has to sovereignly do the work, that you can't do it, then you have to rely on God and not your own works. To save. This is why the megachurch who doesn't believe in the doctrines of Reformed theology, this is why they get the, the lion on the stage. 
and why they have the big lights and why they have the, the hyper persuasive messages. Because if, if it's about persuasion, man, bring a lion, man, I'm all in. If it's about persuasion, let's get whatever we possibly can in here to persuade the minds of men. If I need to use PowerPoint, then I'll use PowerPoint. But if it's not about persuasion, and if it's actually just about the faithful proclamation that you are a sinner and needing to be redeemed, and that that is the means by which God uses to save his people, then I'll just be faithful. We'll be simple. We'll do what church history has done for two millennia. Now with this question, it's important to understand that unconditional election, unconditional election is not random election. It's not arbitrary election. God doesn't randomly elect people without considering familial relationships. Yeah, God sometimes grafts a person in and then you would expect for his children to be grafted in. But the normative reality, well, I'll say this, God doesn't view us as isolated individuals. That's a very American reality, that we just think of ourselves as just isolated, even in our own families, we think we're just independent people in our own family. We fail to think covenantally around these realities. Uh, Genesis 12, 3, uh, God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God's not thinking individually. He's thinking about family covenants. So the normative pattern of election, if you just look throughout history, if you look at your own experience, is that God saves through families. God saves through families. Now, yes, you have first-generation Christians like myself where God saved me outside of a family. But then I have friends that I can watch their parents being saved, their grandparents being saved, their great-grandparents being saved, and you see this beautiful covenant nurturing of salvation and expectant redemption that's coming through family lines. So what I'm saying is that if you're a believer, you can be confident that your children are elect because God has placed them in your house. God's placed them under your care in a Christian home. Now, the child of the Hindu family, the child of atheists, does not have the same assurance of election as the baby that has two saved parents. And why do we, why? Well, because God put the means of salvation. And if he has the means there, we should expect the ends. We should expect the ends are a saved child. So why can you anticipate my nine-month baby coming to Christ? Because he's in my house. And because the Lord put him here and not in the Hindu or Muslim family. Because he is going to be raised hearing the gospel every day of his life. Because he has been put as a grace into the church of God. Now, does this mean that God is going to save every one of these Christian children in a Christian home? No. It does not mean that. Unfortunately, we have the reality that we live in a fallen world. If you look to this tree, you're going to see a vine. The normative reality is that there's growth from it. But if you look to almost every branch, you're going to see that out of the 40 green leaves, there's a dead leaf. There's a dead twig. And that happens. But the normative reality is that we get to trust that God has saved our children or will save our children because he has saved us. Amen? And the third question, if God predestines, how can God rightly judge the reprobate? This is the exact matter that Romans 9, 10 through 24 deals with. Verses 19 through 22 anticipates an objection to uh, God hardening the hearts of particular individuals or not extending mercy to someone that wanted mercy or deserved, from the perspective of man, mercy. Um, Paul writes, 
in verses 19 to 22 in chapter 9. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? He's going, if God is the one that predestines people and hardens hearts, and how can he still find fault? The next verse says, for who resists God's will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another vessel for dishonor? Can God not do that? Can you not let God be God? Can God not make one lump of the clay for dishonorable use and one for honorable use? Does that anger you too much? Ultimately, we wrestle with the idea that humans are morally accountable to God even though they do not have ultimate self-determination. We struggle with that. I like what John Piper said. He said, quote, this is not a logical contradiction. It's a paradox. There is no injustice with God. No one is punished who does not truly deserve to be punished. God's sovereignty and man's accountability are in perfect compatibility. The whole Bible testifies to both truths, and we must submit to them even if we cannot fully comprehend them. There's a mystery. There are three great mysteries in the Bible. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Jesus being fully God and fully man. And the Trinity. How does it work? I don't know. I wish I could tell you exactly how it works. Dr. James White and Doug were having a conversation once about the Trinity. And Doug said, we have to remember that talking about the Trinity is like ants talking about calculus. We have to remember the gravity of those discussions. Now remember, no reprobate man or woman wants grace. No reprobate man or woman wants to be restored. They hate God. They hate Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To us, predestination ought to be a sweet doctrine. It should be something to be cherished as a mercy. For without God's benevolent predetermination to conform us to the image of his son, we would remain in the image and likeness of fallen Adam. But then the apostle closes out to the purpose of this foreknowing and the predestining. He says, the very end of that verse, he says, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. The man Jesus, I'm talking about his humanity, the man Jesus Christ, he is the first elect of humanity. He's the first elect of humanity. He is the model of our conformity and the head of our new human ancestry. He is the firstborn among many brethren. Christ is not the only born free from death, but the firstborn free from death. God is anticipating that more will be like him. He's not the only one. He's the beginning. He's the beginning. And in the same way that the first Adam reproduced his sinful likeness, the second Adam, Christ, will reproduce his sinless likeness. This is probably at the core part of my eschatology. I believe that the resurrection of Christ will outperform the fallenness of Adam. I believe that Christ will outproduce Adam. And in this whole concept, this whole concept of this, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, it, it really gives us this vital truth 
that God is saving a people for himself. You know what makes marriage special? Is because God, or because a, a man chose a woman for himself. Out of all the women in the world, he chose that one. It's what makes it special. It's what makes it beautiful. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said something along the lines, many men will allow other men to choose their bride, but will not allow Christ to choose his. It's a ridiculous notion. God is choosing a people for himself. 1 Peter 2.9 says of this corporate congregation of God's elect, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. I'll close with this. This should cause us to step back for a moment and see the grandeur of God's plan. You were foreknown before you were born. God has laid his affection upon you in a way that you had no control over. We should be in awe that we are included in this holy nation. You're included. When you look at the world, God saved you from that and you're included. There is a specialness, a sweetness that comes with that truth. It's the same sweetness that a wife says, I can't believe he chose me. I can't believe he chose me. Of all the women in the world, he chose me. Right? That, that concept is truly being communicated here. It should cause us to see the beauty of benevolent providence. That God works all things together for those people whom he called, whom he foreknew. And because of that assurance and that relationship and that affection, he predestined us. And he called us with the gospel and he justified us and he glorified us. Past tense. It's an amazing truth that you are resting in this beautiful orchestration that God is putting together for your life. There was a time in which you didn't know that you were going to be saved. But there was no point in history in which you were not God's person, God's elect. While you were lost, tumbling around and sinful reality and drugs and whatever may have been in your past, if you're saved, God was watching, foreknowing you before the foundation of the world, working out that order salutis in your own life. It is a beautiful thing to rest in the providence of God. And when we rest in that providence, it gives us hope. It gives us hope in these present sufferings because we know that we're not in control. Yeah, we have free agency. But at the end, no matter what happens to us, we will be glorified. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful assurance of salvation. Lord, that you are causing all things to work together. Father, I pray that you would help our hearts yield to these difficult doctrines. Lord, that you would overcome them in our hearts and that you would work these things together. Father, that we would appreciate our salvation and knowing that you are the captain and finisher of our faith. We thank you for not leaving us without understanding but that you've given us clarity in your word that we might appreciate your purpose in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.